Good morning. Good morning and welcome to uh, this hour. <clears throat> SBC 21 Intentional Mentoring Academy Shining the Light on Race Relations webinar. We're so excited that you agreed to join us this morning and we just want to open up with a word of prayer and we'll have introduction a little bit more about our purpose as we go on. Let us pray. Gracious and almighty God, who is to give of every good and perfect gift, we give you praise. We thank you, God, for allowing us to gather in this way to talk about the business of your church. We trust and pray that everything that we say and do will be pleasing in your sight. Oh God, touch each and every one of the participants and anoint the ears of those who are listening. That at the end of this program, oh God, there may be something that's been said or done that may enrich your kingdom and bring glory to your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, and praise God. Hallelujah. Again, uh, good morning and thank you for joining the SBC 21 uh, webinar. Uh, SB21 is a national program of the United Methodist Church designed and to assist uh, predominantly Black congregations to become more efficient in mission and ministry. And so we in the Kentucky Annual Conference have joined along in that struggle uh, to make sure that the vision of the Kentucky Annual Conference and the SBC21 is being adhered to. So we are to provide resources that will discover, develop, and prepare passionate and spiritual leaders within predominantly African-American churches to make all disciples for Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And our mission in the Kentucky Annual Conference and the SB21 is to have a thriving African-American congregation who are Christ-centered, mission-minded, loving, leading, and learning while making disciples for the transformation of the world. So in that regard, we have a uh, brought together this group of young people in, under the umbrella of Intentional Mentoring Academy. Now I want to present to you uh, their uh, lead a mentor in the person of Minister Jane Brown Thompson. She provides you with the introductions of our mentoring participants. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining our webinar. As a part of this transformational work of the SBC 21, we have identified young adults 40 years and under in our African-American churches and established an intentional mentoring academy. These young people meet regularly and are being encouraged to maximize their spiritual gifts and skills as they engage in ministry in their respective congregations. Our goal has been to train and grow spiritual leaders while mentoring these young people and supporting them in an educational and nurturing environment. And I want to introduce them to you today. First we have, if you could just raise your hand. First we have um, Reverend Leticia Williams Priestley. And she is the pastor of Duncan Chapel United Methodist Church in Lexington, Kentucky. She has been a part of the Kentucky Conference for nine years and has also served as the executive pastor of Embrace United Methodist Church in Lexington, Kentucky. And as a associate uh, at Wesley United Methodist also in Lexington. Leticia is a servant leader and is passionate about seeing people live in the fullness of God's purpose liberation, transformation, and spiritual uh, information. And next, we have Sharice Baldwin. Sharice is happily married to her best friend, Pastor Stephen Trana, Jr. of Sycamore Chapel United Methodist Church in Pee Wee Valley. They are the blessed parents of Shelby Alexandria and Christian. Sharice is a certified lay servant of the United Methodist Church and has been an active member of the United Methodist Church in various leadership positions since the age of 14. Sharice continues to support her husband at Sycamore and also she works and remains active in her community. Erin Turner. Erin, a Louisville native who is personally dedicated to the development of family and community. His exemplary leadership, compassion, and moral guidance has proven to have a positive impact on the quality of life 
for those he serves. Aaron worships at Amazing Grace and serves as lay leader there. He was honored as a winner in 2019 with the Real Black Man Award. And also in 2019, he was the recipient of the Pan Methodist Martin Luther King Celebration Young Adult Civil Rights Award. 2019 was a good year for Aaron. Terry Cunningham, Reverend Terry Cunningham II, is originally from Louisville, Kentucky, but is a proud native of Maysville, Kentucky. He has served as clergy in the United Methodist Church since June 2012. He is currently appointed as an associate pastor at Fruente de, de Abavamente, Mento, uh, Spring of Revival in Lexington, Kentucky. Pastor Steve Trainum is next, and he is a man of God and married to the best, the most beautiful woman in the world. Hey, hey. He has three amazing kids, 23, 19, and nine, and their family has recently added two new family members in Stormy and Jackson. They are their pets. Steve, uh, pastor Steve is the senior pastor of Sycamore Chapel United Methodist Church and has been the pastor there since 2017. He is a first year student at Asbury Theological Seminary looking to obtain his Master of Divinity degree. Pastor Steve believes in the words spoken in 1 John 5, 4, that tells us that our faith in God is our victory. Thank you. I want to uh, begin our conversation um, this morning with the, with the first question to all of our mentees. This week for me has been an emotional roller coaster, and perhaps like you, uh, after the announcement of the Attorney General Daniel Cameron uh, grand jury decision in the Breonna Taylor case. I know traumatic for the city and perhaps for some of you as we witnessed um, only one officer out of three that was charged with, with anything and, and the one that he was charged with was an endangerment which has nothing to do with uh, Breonna's case and the other two were not charged with anything. So this, this whole um, uh, situation about Brianna Taylor being shot, young lady, black woman in her apartment, and no one being charged. Uh, so I just want to pose the question to all of you, young, gifted, and black people. How has this uh, decision impacted you personally? And we can just start. I'm, I'm just let's start with the uh, Aaron, brother Aaron, Aaron Turner. Can you can you share the Aaron, which was followed by Sharice, and then uh, uh, Terry and I mean, then Leticia and then Steve. Yes, ma'am. Um, <clears throat> the uh, the decision impacted me personally with a feeling of uh, just sure disappointment um, because, uh, you know, time and time again, um, we are just reminded of how much our justice system is unjust. You know, I mean, it made me feel hopeless, you know, sad. But at the same time, almost numb, because I wasn't really surprised that none of the um, police officers were not charged with a murder. It's just, you know, the simple fact that I'm just sick and tired of, uh, you know, just feeling broken about <coughs> having unjust in our society and our community when things like this happen. Um, it, because it doesn't, it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't feel right. It doesn't sound right. And then, you know, to talk to all my friends and family who has been, uh, you know, protesting heavily, and you can just hear the brokenness and the sadness of, you know, like I said, sheer disappointment. Because we, I mean, we're sick and tired and we're exhausted. But we know we got to continue to fight. We know we got to continue to work. We got a lot of work ahead of us, and we're and we're still diligent about that. But uh, overall, I was disappointed. To be honest, I am still processing the information. Um, when I think about other past events, I realize that this is not the first Brianna Taylor situation. Uh, Brianna Taylor happened to 28 year old Sandra Bland while in police custody in Texas. Um, 
And, you know, I also think about my family and, you know, there are some places that people can explore. There are some people in this world that can explore this country without any fear of potentially being killed, um, being hung up on a tree. Um, but there are some like me who worry about that happening to them strictly because of the color of, of my skin. Um, but, and well, I don't have the privilege, excuse me, I don't have the privilege of being one of those people that don't have to think about, um, this potential danger, um, to me and my family. And when I want to spend the day with my family, I have to think about what part of Kentucky or Indiana can we go to that is safe for us. And I can't go to my closet and unbutton my black skin and place it on a hanger until I decide I want to be black again. This is who I am and this is who I will forever be. So you ask me about how was this decision how this decision impacted me personally i will be honest and say it has put me on high alert and i will continue to spread the love of god but i have been awakened to the injustice that surrounds us for me, for me, the uh, decision um, that was released by our attorney general just um, allowed me to re remember, well, first, my condolences to the family of uh, Breonna Taylor and the constant need to pray uh, for them um, through this traumatic and tragic situation. But also, uh, it just reminded me of our call as Christians is beyond the scope of simply, you know, the pulpit, um, the reminder of being in, involved in uh, the systems of government uh, so that this, these decisions do not repeat themselves. Um, because when you have people that are in the position to change the laws, to be able to reflect a more just uh, outcome, uh, that's the only way I feel like that change can be made. And so that's where uh, this decision really caused me to reflect personally and inwardly about, you know, where as a ministerial leader uh, do I view the calling uh, to not just to reach people with the good news of Jesus Christ but also to uh, help encourage disciples to go forth uh, in ministry outside of the local church. I certainly um, would like to extend my condolences to the family of Brianna Taylor as well when I consider how this has impacted me personally. The main word that comes to mind is heaviness. There is just this immense heaviness that continues to grow. You know, once you think you don't have any more energy to expend, once you think that you have reached the end of your frustration, your sadness, your um, irritation, your desire, to see just as happens, you continue to learn and hear about more and more and more and more incidents. And we know that there are so many more out there and hearing about the Breonna Taylor um, jury decision was heavy. It was heavy. Um, it also caused me to make a decision to become more vocal and more intentional about being public about how I feel, about um, the work that needs to be done and to make sure that while I, it's my preference to stay in the background. It is my preference to work with in people individually in communities, one individual at a time and to, to have impact in that way. But we are at a point in our um, history and in our culture and society when all of us really do have to come together in solidarity and to raise our voices and to make our voices heard and to no longer stand for the, the system 
of the so-called legal system that's supposed to be just for everyone, which is clearly only just for particular individuals, um, we have to continue to press forward and to make our voices heard and to take action and let the larger society know this is not acceptable. It is completely unacceptable. And we will not rest until we begin to see deep changes made, um, legislative changes made, policy changes made from the national governmental level to the municipalities that rule over us down to our local governments. Um, there has to be come a justice system that provides justice for everyone. And that is just our reality. Um, it gets to the point where you're tired of talking about it. And for me personally, I'm always thinking and praying about, okay, God, what is our response? How do you want us to address this from a strategic standpoint? Because it's one thing to be angry and to make our voices heard, but it's a completely different um, situation and ball game when we actually begin to approach these matters from a strategic standpoint that will allow the long-term positive changes that um, we seek to come about in our society. Well, for me, <clears throat> uh, this uh, ruling that took place, uh, the, the first response um, that I had was um, a response of really not being surprised. Um, it's taken several months <laughs> to even get this little bit of news. And I feel like our justice system, I feel like our mayor, uh, the mayor of Louisville has let us down. I feel like our police force uh, continues to let us down. I feel like our government officials throughout the state of Kentucky have let us down. Um, I feel like they wanted to announce something uh, that sounds like good news and uh, the uh, charges that were brought on the one police officer for wanting endangerment. But that had absolutely nothing to do <laughs> with uh, Breonna Taylor and her being killed. Um, I just, for me, it, it really, I kind of echo everybody else's sentiments here. Uh, I feel, uh, I don't feel surprised, but then I also feel surprised. I feel sad. I feel let down. Um, I feel like the only way we can truly move forward in all things, and I know it may sound cliche coming from a pastor, is that we have to put our faith and our, our trust in everything we have in God and mm -hmm. Jesus Christ and him being the one that has the only answers for us. And, and that may be where we are right now. Uh, this may be the Lord's way of telling us and showing us that, hey, it's time for us all to just wake up, come out of ourselves, and put everything we have in him. And that's the only way we're gonna move forward. But all in all, for me personally, I just feel let down. Thank you all. Thank you all for this. Uh, our second question is for uh, Reverend Leticia. In this time of social unrest and pain being inflicted on some because of the color of their skin. One may feel, as you all have talked about, discouraged, not uh, knowing what to do, uh, some folks, and not feeling equipped to do anything. We as Christians, however, know that we cannot sit back and pretend that nothing is happening and separate ourselves from our brothers and sisters of color. Our very existence demands that we act. How do you see relationships being formed across the connection between the races to move the needle forward and address the issue of race relations? Leticia? This is um, such a thoughtful and important question, Minister Jan. And I first love that your question presupposes that building relationship across the connection um, within our churches and within our denomination is essential. And I love that your question also presupposes that intentional action must be taken in this area in order for us to be able to move the needle forward even more. Um, I, I would like to just 
bring us to Matthew 18, 15 through 20 first, because when we talk about actually beginning to come together um, across our connection with regard to races, we need to realize that this is a conversation of reconciliation first. And Matthew 18, 15 through 20, it lays out clear guidelines for us as Christians um, to be able to see what it looks like to engage in reconciliation and healthy progress towards the like. So we love to lift up verse 18 and the following where Jesus asserts, truly I tell you, whatever we bind on earth um, will be bound in heaven and whatever we loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. Um, for where two or three are gathered in my name, I am among them. This message we love to lift up because for many, um, the message of these verses too often get lost on preachers and parishioners and they begin to look at it as a way to exert our spiritual authority over powers and principalities and to cast down demons and unholy imaginations and to call forth the blessings and the promises of God. Well, when I began to study this passage even more, um, what I realized is that this passage is actually often misinterpreted and misunderstood. The binding and loosing actually has to do with exercising judgment on conduct. Exercising judgment on conduct. So whatever we bind and loose here is with regard to behavioral expectations for how we should conduct ourselves as the body of Christ, which is, which makes sense and it's really important considering that this is a passage largely about reconciliation. And so here we're talking about addressing offenses and how we should behave towards one another as the body. So we realize from this particular passage that offenses are inevitable. They happen, they have happened, they will continue to happen. Um, and that we need to seek reconciliation when offenses and or sin happens. This is actually a, a mandate for us, but it also lets us know that when we begin to address offenses, when we begin to address sins that are made against us, this is going to potentially bring us into a place of confrontation, right? It's gonna bring us into a place of confrontation because um, this is really hard for a lot of people to do and to want to deal with. But regardless, as Christians, there is no way around the mandate that as believers, we must begin to address sin with the goal of clearing up the matter and bringing the individuals back into right relationship from a communal and a spiritual standpoint. So getting to this place of resolution and repentance and right behavior, that is what allows us to be able to have unity as the body of Christ um, and as a, 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 a body of faith believers who are coming together, hopefully in order to proclaim the gospel and the good news and to bring that into um, fruition for the kingdom of God to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so if that is our goal, to address the sin with the goal of clearing up the matter, coming back into right relationship with one another, then we have to acknowledge that repentance is necessary. It says that um, we have to come to these conversations from a place of listening to one another. The one who has committed the offense has to listen. And both parties have to be willing to receive. So at the most base level, we have to actually address the sin that happens, that is happening, which in this case is racial injustice from a posture of listening and from a posture of, that will lead to repentance and a resolution. With this, Let's look at some really basic and practical ways this connection between the races can take place and is already taking place um, in some cases. So first, in order to address the sin, with regard to our white sisters and brothers, 
there has to be an awareness of who the racially ethnic churches are in our conference, starting at the district level and going wider. Um, often, we as the African American communities and racially ethnic communities, we know about the white churches and where our white sisters and brothers worship because those are the churches that tend to be more prominent, more prominently lifted, more prominently supported, more prominently resourced within our, um, our conference and you know globally but we're talking about our conference here right so we are aware of them we typically take efforts to reach out to them and to go across the the aisle right but they often don't take the time to become aware of who we are and so first like let's make sure that we establish an awareness of who your racially ethnic brothers and sisters are within the conference um second like consider who you know do you personally know individuals who worship in these racially ethnic congregations. If so, great, reach out to them, let them know you care and would like to find ways to collaborate. Um, this is also true for the racially ethnic churches as well. It is our responsibility to all be intentional about identifying and nurturing opportunities to deepen our relationships with one another. Now, we realize that there are many dynamics in the background and at play with regard to addressing these hypersensitive issues. Um, so as white people, it is important to gain a certain level of education about how pervasive this age old issue of racial injustice is um, across our nation, across the globe, and to be intentional about attending cultural competency um, seminars and implicit bias trainings. Also consider ways that you can advocate for and serve as an ally to our racially ethnic, particularly Black and African American communities as we lift up the racial contention that is happening against Black lives in our society. Um, this makes a difference. It makes a difference to um, us as Black people and Black friends, peers, and colleagues. And if you happen to not have any Black friends or peers, um, then this will begin to organically allow these relationships to be built and deepened. So third, um, actually taking time to get to know one another as we're talking about relationship, right? Because if we don't take time to get to know one another and who our sisters and brothers are, then these actions can become another box to check off. And that's the last thing we wanna begin to, to and kind of get, and be have you wanna engage in. So create time to actually have general conversations with one another, then consider ways um, and creative opportunities to gather together and begin to collaborate on different initiatives. From a spiritual formation standpoint, have a Bible study, a book study, a video study, or any kind of study together, right? Grow as followers of Jesus. It, it, it allows us to to, to build that intimacy and the bonds that we seek to develop so that we can genuinely care about one another and what's going on with, within our community um, from the standpoint of honoring and realizing that it's important to ally, be an allyship with regard to Black Lives Mattering because we have issues within our church of racial injustice and discrimination um, and even oppression. So from there, um, we can come together and collaborate on ways to do good in our community. And this allows us to begin to get to a place where our hearts, minds, hands, and resources are becoming more unified, which is then what will allow and expand our positive impact um, that we're able to have within our communities and within the body of Christ. Um, too often, the opportunities to be a blessing to one another within the body gets missed. And so there, cause there's a lot of people suffering and struggling in our own faith communities. Um, and so let's begin addressing those ways that we can um, be and do good. And then also going from there into our wider communities. And we can join in work that's already being done and, and join in partnerships with churches. Um, for instance, when I served at Embrace United Methodist, Southern Hills United Methodist would come to our church once a month to pack weekend bags for the students at Arlington Elementary. Their church um, was more widely resourced and larger. 
So they will provide the food and the backpacks and the resources and the team to actually pack them up. And as Embrace, we offered them the space to store everything and to work. And then we would actually make sure that those packages got delivered to Arlington. Um, this was a great collaborative effort that gave us the opportunity to get to know one another as we served. Um, in light of our current racially charged context, Duncan Chapel UMC, where I serve, a predominantly and historically black congregation within Lexington, has joined together with Offerings, which is a First United Methodist Church and predominantly white congregation. Um, and we've entered into studying the biblical understanding of justice together. We have um, come to this place as a result of the relationship that I have with Chuck Gutenson, who is a fellow clergy person whom I served with on staff at Embrace. We came together and said, hey, how can we grow together in this journey, especially in light of all that's going on? And so we decided to launch this collaboration with, um, by listening to a lecture that the UK Gatton School of Business offered by um, an incredible presenter about the multi-path journey of Black Wall Street. Because right, that helps us to get an educational um, and historical undergirding of the injustices that have taken place for so long. And it gives us that understanding that this is real. Like it's not imaginary. Yes, the Black community is discriminated against, has been for some time, continues to do so. Um, and so what we've also realized in the midst of all of this is that when we come together collaboratively, which is no brainer, right? As a body of Christ, we should want to come together. It also begs the, to notice and acknowledge that this is not always easy to do because there's going to be challenges that are going to arise. There's going to be differences of perspectives and opinions and that confrontation can happen. But as long as we are committed to continuing to bear together with one another in love and to be honest with one another, then we keep pressing forward through those challenges. And it's amazing the kind of impact um, that we can have when we consider coming together and building relationships across racial boundaries within our conference. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Leticia. That was uh, awesome. Wish we had time to really unpack uh, all of that, especially about the offender becoming the listening, because that's where it all began. We appreciate appreciate your, um, your in-depth uh, uh, answer to that question. We're going to move to our, our question uh, number three. This is for Aaron and Steve. Historically, we have witnessed individuals throughout the world who have marched in protest about issues that impacted their lives and the lives of their family. But presently, in our very own beloved Louisville, Kentucky, we have seen protests and marches for over 192 days where people have been protesting and marching, primarily because of uh, the Breonna Taylor incident, this young lady again, as you all are familiar with, who was uh, murdered in her uh, uh, apartment, an African-American woman that was shot by the police, uh, who was, um, you know, very, um, the gift to the society and her community, but yet she was shot. So what would you say to persons who do not understand why individuals are in the streets protesting in our community and other places? There are people who are saying, don't do it too much. It's out, it's out of order. What would you say to those people as we understand that right to protest? It's uh, uh, Aaron, Steve. Um, I, I would explain to them people um, just simply by saying individuals are in the streets protesting in our community and around the country and other places because people just want equality. Simple fact, you know, human rights, civil rights. You know, th these people are not looting, they're not rioting. Um, you know, they're not condoning violence against, you know, towards the police. They are protesting for the simple fact they just wanna, we just want a level playing field, you know, for all humans. We're fighting for justice, we're fighting for peace, we're fighting for, for freedom. And, you know, the simple fact that we want to bring awareness to Black Lives Matter, you know, we just want to bring people's awareness up. 
and we you are able to protest in thousands of ways. Some of it is, a lot of it is very peaceful, but at the same time, people get agitated because people are sick and tired. So people, you know, may raise their voices. People may, you know, be boisterous about things, but that doesn't mean it's a violent protest. And I think people get, you know, lump it all together with rioters, looters, protesters, but we are just fighting for freedom and, and, and equality across the board. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, well, for me, I would uh, I would first want to make sure that they are aware of what truly what it truly means to protest. Um, I'm reminded of Colin Kaepernick in 2016 when he started his protest uh, at the beginning of football games during the uh, uh, the the singing of the national anthem, and a lot of people were uh, in, up in arms because of him. Uh, protesting uh, this very matter uh, that we're discussing right now. Um, I, I'm, I'm reminded of the saying that uh, when it gets too hard to stand, kneel. Well, Kneeling is a, a sign of prayer. This is a sign of, of reverence and respect to God that we uh, offer him on a daily basis. Um, I mean, really, I believe all protests, uh, are, are, we all protest many things in our lives, right? I mean, any time an action or a statement is made towards individuals that others do not agree with, uh, we should all expect that those uh, people that do not agree will protest it. Once I establish a mutual understanding there, I would urge those individuals to please pay attention to what's being said. Um, do not just uh, listen so that you can critique and, and correct, but change your heart to truly understand what is being said. Rather than just look and listen, think of this all as a conversation. Mm -hmm. Conversation we know is a talk between two or more people in which news and ideas are exchanged. So let us converse about the issues that plague us as African Americans. Maybe put the shoe on the other foot for a change. Mm -hmm. I mean, really imagine this happening to you and your family and tell me you would not be outraged by the actions taken against you. Mm -hmm. And I want to touch on the, the Black Lives Matter conversation for a second. Uh, for me to hear many people say in response to Black Lives Matter that all lives matter or blue lives matter, it says to me that they're not really wanting to acknowledge the fact that Black lives actually matter. Yeah. Are not Black lives included in all lives? Blue lives, that's not even a race of people, but an occupation. So are you saying that someone's job means more than the lives of an entire ethnic group? The Bible says this in the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God, he created him, man and woman. He created them. Does this not insinuate that all lives matter? So rather than assume that black lives means that only black lives matter, you know, let's start thinking about our, the statement of all lives matter. Are you not saying that black lives are not included? in the All Lives Matter statement. Shakespeare wrote, friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. And I would add to that, lend me your hearts also. Well. The day that the Attorney General of Kentucky announced the decision that, uh, that were made in regards to the death of Breonna Taylor, I watched it on WOKY's uh, Facebook page and was able to watch people's commentary along the bottom of the feed. But I read a comment someone entered that said, you all need to remember that she was a drug dealer. My first reaction is like, seriously? The insensity, uh, insensitivity that uh, commentary and other comments that uh, I have read over the last six months have continuously left me in a state of astonishment. Hmm. I mean, I really should not be so surprised, but the audacity of some to just outright display no sense of empathy for another speaks more towards an inhumane issue that lies at the root of racism. Thank you all so much uh, for, for your answers uh, to that. The next question uh, is going to go, I believe, to Terry and Aaron. Some say that not only are we in the midst of a health pandemic and a social injustice pandemic, but we are also feeling an economic crisis. 
And because persons are losing their jobs and African Americans are being uh, impacted by COVID-19 disproportionately because of pre-existing conditions, uh, small businesses um, in the, uh, I'll just say the West End and, and other areas where African Americans have small businesses are, are unable to remain open because of capital not being available. Uh, and even childcare expenses uh, rising as a result of the schools being closed and, you know, of course, they're operating virtually. How do you see the issue of racism impacting the African American community economically? Terry and then Aaron. Thank you, Ms. Jan. The, uh, this question that definitely, um, you know, to me, is a part of we have a conversation that we have to have uh, in this country uh, that relates to the original sin of this country, which is racism, bringing uh, enslaved Africans um, to this country uh, without their consent and uh, having us um, being a man, a black man of African descent, bringing us and my, my ancestors here uh, to work for nothing. Um, that um, creates uh, over 200 years, you're going to create a wealth gap that uh, inevitably um, is borne out into 2020 with a, uh, in ways that um, have to be addressed. And so for me, the question of you know, how this racism has affected our country economically uh, and a black community economically we have, uh, as black people, um, have been disproportionately uh, given uh, what the angle I want to take is uh, with relation to real estate. Um, if you understand the uh, economic properties, I mean, properties economically, they increase in value over time. Uh, and going back to um, the early parts of um, being freed as slaves, um, that right to own property was denied to us or that came with some severe barriers uh, that went on into uh, even the 60s and the 70s. Uh, I remember my uh, father telling me a story about uh, being uh, with his dad and they were purchasing a home in Maysville and uh, once over the phone uh, they were confirming the details of meeting to see this home, uh, you know, my grandfather and grandmother. And uh, once they arrived and they were black, uh, although my father, my grandfather was uh, a military uh, veteran and had served our country uh, with honor and excellence, uh, was denied um, to even see this home, uh, to be able to get it viewed. Um, but those that were able to uh, take advantage of uh, the opportunities that were afforded to them, uh, those that were um, white Americans, uh, they even in the Great Depression were able to receive uh, the credits that came from our government with the New Deal, to be able to take advantage of those. And over the course of time, uh, as we understand economics, the property values, they've compounded and being able to build and um, establish wealth, even to be able to borrow from them to send their children to college or to be able to borrow from that property to start a business. Uh, those are um, just, those are just factual um, things that have happened that have caused this gap to be created. And so um, to me, that is uh, how that affects us in 2020 is that yes, we may be able to purchase homes, but there is so much ground that has been lost uh, to be able to close this gap between us um, requires uh, some uh, very candid conversation and action um, from our government, and, as well as uh, some personal responsibility and sacrifice uh, from us as black people as well to be able to make up for this um, lost time that was not um, equitable and, and fair to us to begin with. So, uh, Aaron? Yeah, I, I totally agree, uh, Terry, with what you're saying, because it basically comes down to the, you know, the U.S. policies 
that has you know shaped where people live and um, and the opportunities that people have from those communities. You know, it's historical conditions that have you know been very extremely present and persisted that impacts you know the outcome from African Americans, and I, I don't feel like it's accidental at all. Um, uh, I'm speaking from you know things like discrimination. Um, you know, uh, this intimidation to things like policies like white flight, you know, from certain communities, uh, rail lining, um, you know, highway constructions that have presented or prevented, you know, and kept black people in a certain community and not be able to grow outside of that community. Um, you know, different policies from, uh, you know, education, looking at our taxes, not be able to buy homes like you said, not be, and not be able to um, uh, start businesses. And then once we are able to start those businesses, are we able to maintain those businesses? Uh, you know, the pure education of life insurance, building legacies, things has passed down, you know, through generations over, you know, on one side, but on the other side, we're not able to, uh, you know, you know, prefer, expand on those opportunities because we, we wasn't taught it through education. So when you look at the employment discrimination, uh, the social safety net system, uh, the criminal justice system, you know, we, and we go on and on about education because, you know, they teach us a lot about Christopher Columbus in, in school, in the American school system, but they don't tell us how interest rates work, you know, um, they don't tell us about debt and getting in, you know, tons of college debt. You know, they don't, they don't tell us about that part. So, and until we reverse that train of thinking where we're always listening and trying to learn, we need to take the education that we're getting and, you know, and put that in and put that into use. But it starts with the U.S. policies that's put in place and not designed necessarily for us to win. So once we be able to change those and change the education, then we can start making some ground within that. But until we are able to reverse that, we're gonna be in the same situation that we've always been in. I don't wanna be born with the I, I, I like that answer. I mean, like I said, with Leticia, which we had the more, um, uh, to unpack all of that, because you're talking about economic and owning wealth and only land. You know, we missed out on our 40 acres on a mule and wonder how much that would be worth today. That's just a sidebar. Anyway, next question. <laughs> next question for, for Cherise. Um, I have two grandchildren, Aiden and Lena, ages uh, four and eight. And I'm very much concerned about when it comes to their education of doing this COVID-19 age that we're experiencing as well as those children who do not have the village that Aiden and Lena has to make sure they're not left behind. So what, what do we do in this, in this period of doing this higher level of accountability, this non-traditional instruction 2.0, which has moved to a higher level of accountability. So in this season, what are the ways that you see that the church can be helpful in areas in our cities where we know that there are children who will potentially be left behind or just who would definitely be left behind if there are not certain actions that are taken. Cherise. Cherise, you want to unmute yourself, Cherise, please. Sorry, can you hear me? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, First, the church can assist by starting, uh, by focusing our attention on low performing schools and even students and parents that reach out for assistance. It's about building relationships so people will trust your help. When you help, it's important that the church not assist, not, not assist with intentions of increasing their membership, but go in with the intentions, like I said, of building relationships. Um, I suggest that someone from your church that they contact Jefferson County Public School uh, Board of Education or even visit their website so that you can obtain a list of schools 
that are considered CSI, TSI, and schools that receive Title I funding. Um, schools that have been identified as CSI schools, which CSI stands for Comprehensive Support and Improvement, are your lowest performing schools in the state and they are at the bottom 5%. Schools labeled as TSI, targeted support and improvement, may be performing well as a school, but one or more subgroups, um, subgroups are, examples of subgroups are um, groups divided by race, ethnic, ethnicity, special needs, Eng English as a second language. Those groups are performing in the bottom 5% of the school, even though the school is doing well. So with that being said, ways I can see the church being helpful in areas in our city where we know children will be left behind and um, are to first be, be steadfast in prayer. And education is just one of the many hurdles that our children will have to get over and the church must be willing to go into communities where they may be the minority. Um, some examples that I came up with are gather your retired teachers, high school and college students and graduates in your churches and recruit them as tutors with the support of the school, meaning someone will have to reach out you could coordinate Zoom meetings with parents and tutor kids in the same school and grade while, while practicing social distancing. The church could set up safe zones and allow face-to-face -face tutoring for a limited number of students per group and each day. Some children learn differently and for kids that need a little more attention, you can contact the parent and ask how you can assist. Some ways I, will, I would consider are checking the student's work and seeing if they understand their assignments, verifying all their work is completed and turned in on time. And the church can start book clubs and our reading programs for kids and offer some type of incentive like science museum passes, Zoom membership passes, um, Kentucky Kingdom passes or McDonald gift cards. If your church has partnered with the school, they may, the school may also have ways to reward kids and you could work out something with the school staff so the kids that participate in your Zoom book clubs can be rewarded by the school as well. There are so many ways the school, there are so many ways the church can be involved, but you have to be willing to be in a potential uncomfortable environment and com but also be committed to um, grow a relationship with the student and parent. Times are stressful and it may worsen when the kids return to school. Have volunteers from your church to adopt a specific grade and, the per and this particular person could assist in classrooms, run errands for the teacher, assist with school supplies. You could even sponsor family fun nights at your church post COVID, but don't do it, like I said, with the goal of church membership in mind, but with the goal of building relationships. Donate school supplies and electronics that are needed for NTI, laptops, monitors, the mouse that they need for the, for the computer or the laptops. Pay for internet service for a different family in need every month. This is and the last one I would suggest, and, but it is the most important. It is pray, pray, pray. Kids that live and go to school in communities where they may be left behind have probably experienced things that we couldn't even fathom at a, at a young age. I know as um, Steve and I, as we try to maneuver our work days with our son's NTI program, it can be very difficult because the students have a lot of work to do. And we say to each other all the time, I don't know how people who, who work outside the home do it. Thank God we're, we're blessed enough um, 
to have the flexibility. But it's something that I, there's something I want to leave you with. And it's a little scenario that, that I came up with because we tend to always think that it's just about the education. But what I've learned listening to some of my son's um, classes and having to hear a little boy say that he didn't want to be black again black anymore is that these kids are going to school some hungry some um by themselves because mom or dad had to go to work um they're dealing with brianna taylor and everything else that is going on but i want to leave you with this with this scenario if you give me a moment so i say Imagine being a nine-year-old that has to stay home alone because mom works and dad is absent. Being the only child you have only yourself to rely on from 9 a.m. when NTI 2.0 starts until 3 p.m. when it ends. And this is your normal everyday life. Mom, mom comes home mentally exhausted daily because the people on her job make rude and insensitive comments about Brianna Taylor. At work, she is forced to deal with the comments and can't really defend herself because because you are the only child because you are her child and she is your only provider. You are nine years old and you overhear the conversations that your mom has on the phone and the tears she sheds as she tries to figure out how she is going to muster up the strength to go to work with her racist coworkers. You feel helpless at nine, nine years old because there's nothing you can say nor do to take your mom's pain away. You can't even go to your mom to get help processing your own hurt and, and feelings because you don't want to burden her any more than what she already is. So as a nine-year-old child, you just start to prepare yourself for bed knowing that the same hurt you and your mom feel today will be the same hurt that you and your mom will feel tomorrow. And the only thing that your nine-year-old brain can figure out is that the problem has something to do with the color of your skin. There are so many ways that the church can help because racism also affects a child's learning. Thank you, uh, Sharice. I wanted to um, just invite those who are the, uh, listening, those uh, attending to this webinar, to invite you if you have questions about anything like you want to address today uh, at the bottom of your screen there's a place for q a for questions and answers so if you have any questions go there and we have someone that's waiting by to take those questions and we will attempt to uh, address those at the uh, end level of our uh, program here so if there are any questions go to the chat room or the where it says q a and uh, you will be uh, responded to Thank you, uh, uh, Minister Jan. Yes, my question uh, really is, is an extension of uh, what Sharice just shared with us. Uh, all of you have children and we know how important our children are to us. I was sharing with a, with a friend uh, the other day and she was telling me that she came upon her son crying and she asked him what was the problem. And he said that he just wanted to talk to his sister and his sister was in college. And so she asked him, you know, what was the matter? You know, why did he have to talk to her sister? And he said to her, uh, you know, that he just wanted to make sure that she was all right. He had been hearing, uh, overhearing and probably watching some TV uh, on the Breonna Taylor uh, being killed, about her being killed. And he wanted to just make sure that, you know, his sister was doing okay and uh, that she didn't, nothing was wrong with her. Our children are being affected, as Sharice just said, by what is happening in the world in so many ways. And we've got to have some conversations with them. How do you prepare your children 
and the other children that you work with, perhaps a church and other places, how do you prepare your children for a world that you know has racial issues and that sooner or later they are going to encounter prejudice on some level? I believe Erin and Sharif are going to answer this question. Yes. Um, so I am speaking from the experience as a, I'm speaking from the experience as a mother of a biracial young adult, a young black son and a black daughter that is a sophomore at a predominantly white institution. Uh, we find it necessary to pray daily with our nine year old son. Um, and at that time, we also pray for many more people, including the rest of our family. Um, his dad and I sit in his room nightly for devotion and prayer. We teach all three of our children how to love themselves beyond what the world says. And I also inform, inform our, our children that according to the world, they already have one strike against them. And right. that is the color of their skin. They have to trust and believe in God's word, regardless of what the world may say and do. There is nothing wrong with standing up for yourself. We must teach them the importance of voting during the presidential elections, as well as for the local leaders. Um, something that my husband and I started doing several years ago is we would take our son with us to the polls and i know some people take it as a photo opportunity but it's very important that even if it's something that just becomes a habit for your child as they grow up they will learn the importance of voting this is your voice they need to know that their vote does matter um people marching it is in protesting it is important to stand up for who you believe in because if you don't stand up for yourself if we don't teach our children to stand up for themselves and they're just going to fall for anything and you know i had a conversation with my sister the other day and because of just some things that i just don't understand and it's not that um i wasn't taught it but i have I realized, you know, with everything going on with Breonna Taylor, that I have just kind of, I guess, put myself in a bubble where I felt like if I just did what I was supposed to do, then everything would be all right. And I'm, I'm woke. <laughs> like, that's not true. And so as I begin to wake up from this, this re this it's not even a reality but when i wake up from what i thought was a perfect world and and realize that there are a lot of injustices that are going on within my people because i may it, i may not be brianna taylor but brianna taylor is me like there could have been me there could have been one of my daughters you know um and to not get justice we have to explain those things th to our kids and not just send them outside to to play we have to let them un we have to let them be able to express themselves and most importantly love themselves beyond what they see on tv and colorism and everything else um, that they're dealing with but love yourself flaws and all and just continue to preach god's love to your children that's what i do that's what my husband does and that's what we will continue to do Aaron. Yeah, and, and I come from uh, the experience of having a biracial daughter. Uh, she's very young, but at the same time, she uh, has encountered, you know, prejudice, prejudice and racism. And also talk to a lot of uh, just young uh, youth in general that, you know, for sports teams, I got a lot of friends that coach football or, you know, or kids is, you know, going down the wrong path in general. So I have a daily affirmation that I go through when I talk to kids because I want to encourage them and empower them as much as I can. So when I talk to kids or my daughter in particular, even, even though she's only four years old, when kids get um, distracted or hurt or confused about racism or prejudice, 
I always let them know that I, I believe in them. You know, just because things are, you know, rough on them right now and they don't see a, you know, a light at the end of the tunnel, I let them know that I believe in them and I know they can get through it because some kids just need that confidence builder. They just need that reformation in their mind and hearing it from somebody they trust and love that they that you believe in them and that they are able to overcome battles and adversity that's going to, uh, to face them in life. And I also let them know that I'm listening to them because a lot of kids get in situations where they don't feel like they got a voice or their voice just falls on deaf ears where they keep saying it over and over and nobody's listening, nothing's changing and just, just feel like they're just you know chasing their tails. So I always let them know I'm listening and I actually listen. I actually let them talk. And as you can see, I'm listening to her now. See, I just hear her say stuff and I want to try to give the best answer that I can, even though it's not the answer they always want to hear. But at the same time, I'm listening just as a confidant to them. And I also let them know that I'm supporting them because kids get in situations, they feel like they don't have anybody. They don't have anybody to turn to. They've been in a bad situation. They don't feel like they have an outlet to say anything to anybody. They don't want to get any more trouble that they're already in. Or they come across a, a, you know, a racist, racist situation or a prejudice situation, and they might react badly to it. So they might make a, make a mistake. But even, I always want to put it in kids' heads, even when they make mistakes, that I'm still there to support them. Because even at a, in a bad situation, you don't want to make it worse where they feel like they're on an island. And then, they, you know, they, they just get farther out there in the jungle and you can't retrieve them then. So you still want to support them even in bad situations. And let them know that they matter. I mean, some people might not say they might say they don't matter. Some their situation don't matter. You got to let them know that they, they matter, regardless of their skin color, regardless what kind of clothes they're wearing, regardless what kind of jobs their parents have, regardless of what school they go from, go to, they matter, no matter what. And the last thing I always like to let kids know and, or, or, that you love on them. You got to love on them. You got to tell kids, I love you. They got to hear that. Sometimes they don't hear it at home at all. They might not hear it from their parents, you know. And just because you tell a kid that you love them doesn't mean that you're going to be able to solve all the problems. You're not going to be able to do everything for them. But just having a genuine love for them, you just might be able to get them a PlayStation game or an Xbox game or just anything in their mind to let them know that the, the world is messed up, but I love you, man. I, I, I love your hair. You know, I love your shoes. I love your raspy voice. I love how you might, you know, get aggressive and talk loud. Because just because you're in, your differences are who or what makes you who you are, and you got to embrace that. So those are just my daily affirmations I go through with kids, and just try to instill confidence in them, like like I do her. You know, she's had this. I'll just give you share one example about her. Like she always has the issue about her hairs. At some point, <laughs> she now she, somebody said something or done something to where she doesn't want to wear her hair down, and it has bothered me for a long time because she just always wants to put in a ponytail. But, you know, so every time chance I get to give her a ponytail, I just love on that ponytail, you know, just love on her hair. It doesn't matter if it's curly. It doesn't matter what it is. We you love it. And you got to embrace it because everybody, just because people don't look like you and act like you and sound like you doesn't mean you're any less than they are. You're just different and you got to embrace those differences. Very good. Very good. Appreciate that you all being so insightful. This is good, good stuff, <clears throat> and we're gonna definitely have a, a continuation of this. I want to encourage the questions for those who are who are listening. If there are some that you might um, add them to our, our chat or question and answer, so we will be able to address those. Uh, but it's, it's speaking to uh, Terry, Steve, Leticia, um, um, Leticia. So I already touched on some of this, but I want you to. Think about this life of a Christian. We all profess that we are Christians. We we want to be like Christ. We are like the anointed one. We are, and, and, but it's multifaceted. You got to feed the hungry. You got to clothe the naked. You got to make disciples. You got to treat everybody right. At the same time, fight the works of the evil one and sin. But with this understanding that sin is what really separates us from God, and sin is the thing that causes all this rift. How do uh, how are we as Christians uniquely equipped and called to combat the sin of racism 
in the world or just in particularly uh, in our own city and in our conference, in our churches. How would you respond to that, Leticia, Terry, Steve? Um, this is such a crucial question because it acknowledges that as Christians, there should be a distinction in how we combat the sin of racism in the world and in our local context. Um, the fact that we believe in and follow Jesus should make a difference in not only how we show up in the world, but also in our impact. So as Christians, um, we are uniquely equipped in my view because we understand our reality on two levels, the natural and the spiritual, both of which have particular implications. From a natural standpoint, our faith compels us to take action as Reverend Kathy just said, um, in really basic and practical ways, from advocating for the least of these to setting the captives, which I will include the oppressed, the discriminated against, um, the overlooked, the marginalized free, to providing for the material needs of those who lack, to healing the mentally and physically ill, to doing justice, loving kindness and walking humbly with our God and one another, to engage in hard conversations um, and to work towards reconciliation and to live a life in which the expectations for our conduct is higher than for the conduct of those in authority over us. This does not mean that we do not hold those in authority accountable. Um, it simply means that we have to hold ourselves to a higher standard. Um, drawing this language of higher expectations for our conduct and those in authority over us from Matthew 5, 20, after Jesus um, teaches the Beatitudes, he says, for I tell you uh, to his disciples and his followers, unless your righteousness exceeds or your justice exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So therefore, as Christians, it is imperative for us to live a life of high moral values that show up in our conduct, regardless of what those particularly in authority are doing the same or not. Um, it, 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 it means, if you're anything like me, this is hard to hear because it requires work in order to live this out. It means that no matter what we deal with or how corrupt those in authority get, as Christians, how, no matter how much injustice we see and experience as Christians, we are always called to, to take the higher road. We are always called to continue doing and pursuing justice from a place of integrity. And we have to do that even when we don't want to. Um, because the reality with all of the darkness and corruption that we continually see and deal with, sometimes we grow impatient and we want to take matters into our own hands. But this would go against who Jesus calls us to be. And given Jesus's examples, teaching, death, resurrection, and ascent, ascension into heaven, the least we can do is be, is be faithful to who we're called to be. So Jesus is our anchor. When we feel like we're going to lose our minds and we want to act a fool up in here, up in here, um, it is because of our relationship with Christ that the Holy Spirit is able to reel us back in and help us press toward the mark of the higher calling. All of this import is important from a natural standpoint because if we don't live according to the standard, we will inevitably become no better than our, our racist perpetrators. Um, Furthermore, from a natural standpoint, we are equipped to do this by embracing the biblical mandate of authentic community, koinonia, that is coming together as the many members of the one body of Christ and maximizing our time, talents, and treasure, right? Um, because when we do it this way, when we come together in authentic community, it expands our fruit and our natural labor. From a spiritual standpoint, it is important that we realize ultimately that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We realize um, that there 
is, and there is so much evidence to show that the natural world is influenced by what cannot be seen, that is the spiritual world. Everything that we see in our world started as an idea. And as Christians, we realize that we must deal with these dark forces. And the way we do that is with our spiritual protective and tactical gear that allow us to equip ourselves with the full armor of God, that belt of truth, because nowadays people want to live their own truth, but as Christians, we're called to live God's truth. Um, the breastplate of righteousness, again, holding ourselves to a higher con a standard of conduct, the gospel of peace, the gospel is the good news. It is that message that we can carry that transforms people's lives and situations and communities and the trajectory of a whole um, people. It, we have to have the shield of faith because faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So even though we don't see justice, we have to have faith that that is God's intention for us, that we serve a just God. And as we, and as we continue to press forward, as so many of those who came before us, that we will begin to see the fruit of that labor. We, we know that there are so many freedom fighters, so many civil rights leaders, so many activists who have sacrificed their very, sacrificed their very lives and they took the higher road. And it took decades, even centuries, but changes were able to happen. And so we have to have that faith that our work is not in vain. And that as we continue to do good, change and transformation, that inbreaking of the kingdom of God will come to pass and it'll come to pass in our day and not some distant future or in heaven. Um, we have to make sure that we put on that helmet of salvation again, remembering that we are anchored in Christ and that it is the Lord who saw fit to save us in the midst of our crazy, sinful selves and to empower us and to call us his workmanship and to call us his royal priesthood and to call us a mighty nation. We have to remember who we are and we have to remember our salvation. That, that encourages us, that affirmation reminds us to be empowered and to walk in the power of his might. And that is through the Holy Spirit. And then we, 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 we yield the sword of the spirit, right? Because again, our weapon, our battle is not against flesh and blood. And so we go into our prayer clauses. We get on our knees. Um, as my brother Terry talked about protesting earlier, when we, when we can no longer stand, we fall down on our knees and we yield that spirit. Um, of that, that sword of the Holy Spirit, because it is, it is the Holy Spirit that convicts hearts. We know that at the, the source of racism and all this injustice, we see it's a heart issue. It's the heart of the people who make these laws and these policies and this legislation and who creates these systems of inequity, who are in these positions of authority that continue to oppress and brutalize, murder, um, terrorize uh, our people. Mm -hmm. And so we got to handle it naturally, absolutely. But we, then we got to go and we got to handle that thing spiritually. And we have to add to this always and forevermore prayer. When we have done everything that we can do, we stand, okay and we pray. Mm -hmm. um, so when you know this, when you know that your battle is natural and spiritual, when you approach life from this perspective and issues such as racism from this point, then your strategy changes, your strategy expands, your perspective shifts. You realize that you are a vessel, an ambassador, um, a, a, an instrument of God's will. We realize that we don't do this in our own strength because if we, eat, if we did, we would all be gone right now because we have lost our strength. We, we have been drained and exhausted several times over and continue to be so. And so when we know that we are a people who are a spiritual people, we can then go to those invisible forces that are behind the scenes working and, 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 and attack that battle in that, spiritual, in that place of spiritual warfare. Amen, my sister. Let the church say amen. 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 Thank you amen. for those comments. Uh, I just want to add my two cents to this question uh, because I think it's a, a, certainly a relevant one. And um, yeah, I my base my thoughts about this from Mark uh, chapter twelve, verses twenty-eight to thirty-one. It says, "One of the teachers came, teachers of the law came and heard them debating, noticing." that Jesus had given them an answer. He asked them of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one answered Jesus is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. And so when, when I think about how we are as the body of Christ called and equipped to combat the sin of racism, we have to realize that um, the, the weapons, as Pastor Priestley has shared, you know, they're not um, limited to the, the, the flesh and blood. You know, this is um, the, the spiritual component ha cannot be overlooked. And so when we are um, speaking of disagreements and, you know, the way that we see things may be differently or we cannot neglect the call of Jesus to us as the body of Christ to love our neighbor as ourselves. And so when I look at the comments, when I'm looking at the news um, on my phone and they get the Facebook notification, I see these vicious comments uh, coming from people uh, that are just spewing out things that are not loving and um, even uh, neglecting to find compassion for a fellow human being. Um, I find that to be in conflict with what Jesus has called us to love our neighbor as ourselves. And so the call to us to combat racism, I believe, is um, is to to show that love for one another. If you can't, as a uh, as a white person, be able to see a black person in a way that um, that you would want to be treated, meaning that you wouldn't want to trade places with them um, because of their treatment, then you know we've got work to do, and that that means there's a call to action uh, for whatever sphere of influence you have to be able to lend your voice to be able to make sure that all of God's children are being um, addressed in the way that is appropriate. Uh, one last thing, um, I think that's important for us to remain in our identity of Christ as being the one that is the umbrella above all of our identities. Um, yes, I identify as a black male, but what takes precedent of that is my identity as a child of God. And because of that, that allows me to be able to see, no matter who they are, what socioeconomic status, what their education background, no matter who this person that is in front of me is, I can be able to see them as one who is made in the Imago Dei, of the image of God. And so when I, if we can take that, then our political identities or our racial identities or our um, cultural identities can take a back seat where they rightfully belong as we seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and everything else um, will be in proper alignment. Um, I want to share with you this uh, that I saw on Facebook uh, a few days ago. It says that we cannot put our trust in uh, the elephant or the donkey um, because our trust belongs in the lamb. And so I hope that you'll take that and to be able to carry that with you um, as my remarks about this question. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Pastor Terry and Pastor Leticia, I'm getting ready to echo some of what y'all saying right now. <laughs> um, with this question, it, it's, it's only fitting for me to uh, take you all to the Bible as well. In the book of James, the second chapter, verses 8 and 9, it says, if you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. Right. Now, how does one show favoritism to all people? Hmm. Um, is that even possible? If you look up the word favoritism by its definition, it tells us that it is the practice of giving unfair preferential treatment to one person or group at the expense of another. Does that not sound like racism today? As Christians, we must first acknowledge the sin of racism exists. Many people that call themselves Christians do not see the many acts of violence by the police against our African-American communities as being wrong. Many feel the police are justified in their treatment of black people because those black men and women are thugs, drug dealers, and probably did something to deserve the treatment they receive anyway. Okay. Have not we as Christians been instructed to love our neighbors as ourselves? 
that love for our neighbors is at the front of what we need to do to combat racism in our city and within our conference. It was at Kentucky Annual Conference in 2019 when my wife was encountered by a gentleman giving a pitch about a camp here in Kentucky. He proceeded to tell her that he tends to call his kids monkeys and their parents apes or gorillas. Now, as an African-American woman, those cute little nicknames are not so cute. She kindly tried to explain to the gentleman that those are nicknames that certain ethnic groups would not take kind to and would find offensive. But his response was not one of understanding. No, it, he proceeded to say that they don't know what they want to be called. <laughs> now, I'm not going to rehash the entire encounter and the entire conversation, but that tells us that there are many people out here that do not understand that they are a part of the problem simply because they believe that others should view the world through their lenses. That as African Americans, well, we have an option to view the world from lenses of our white counterparts. If we keep things at this human level, we will never come to a place of commonality because as humans, commonality does not exist between the different ethnic groups. We continually set up different subgroups within subgroups to identify with that with, with, with that keeps us from being able to see eye to eye with one another. So you ask how we as Christians are uniquely equipped and called to combat the sin of racism? My answer is simple. We see the world through the eyes of Jesus Christ. We see and we know that we must love our neighbors as ourselves. We understand that God created us all, male and female, in his very image, not our own, not in the image of my son looking just like me. You know, it's, it's our image was created based on God's image. Even in the scripture in Genesis, there are only two groups spoken about, and that is male and female. Not black and white or Hispanic and Native American. With every one of us on this panel today being so completely different from each other as African Americans, we are even different shades of black. So does that mean I should be considered to be more black than my brothers and sisters here because my skin is darker? I hear the question, does God see color a lot? And my answer is yes, because he created us to be masterpieces. I mean, read Ephesians 2 and 10. God sees us as, uh, as we are, but only judges us on who we obey and truly pledge our allegiance to. All in all, we must remain faithful to the commandments that Jesus has given us. And more importantly, remember, not to grow weary in doing good, because our faith, our faith is our victory. This is how we win this thing, through our faith in Jesus Christ, the one and only who came into this world to die for our sins, who we should put all our faith and our trust in. Amen. Amen. We are coming to the close of our webinar, and I want to thank the mentees of SBC 21 for sharing their heart with us today. It is an extreme pleasure to work with these young people, and uh, I am just so grateful for them. We want to thank uh, Dr. Kathy Goodwin as our director, who is leading us in such an excellent way. I hope that those who have listened in today uh, will make a commitment to join with us in our move to continue to the conversation in the United Methodist Church on race relations because only then will we see a change. I want to leave you with the scripture uh, coming from Micah 6, 8. We as Christians are called to act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God. God bless you. Thank you. Again, I want to thank each and every one for the participants, these mentees, and for our uh, uh, chief leader in this, uh, Minister Jan Brown Thompson, that's leading me for in this in this effort. We just thank God for how God is moving uh, in these leaders as we prepare and hopefully for the Kentucky Annual Conference. Uh, one of the things that we've heard throughout is about the, the about protests and all. We know that there was a protest in Jesus when he went to the temple and protested. You know, we, we got to do that. One of the one of the other resources that has come out of the SBC 21. Uh, in our discussion is that do you see what I see Bible study? I want to encourage you to use that. 
from John 4, where Jesus goes out of his way, goes the direct route to encounter the woman at the well, someone who was seen un unclean. He met a common place at Jacob's well and began to find out what they had in common. Jesus needed drink. She was thirsty. She needed Jesus. And so when we come in those contacts, there is something that each of us can offer in relationship. So I want you to talk about how we how we see no color, how that's so important to us and not having uh, seeing no color is not seeing me for who I really am. I want to encourage you as you enter these relationships, understand the historical point where person have done that context, their culture. It is also important. And then as Steve mentioned about that definition for favoritism, and understanding uh, how we show that and we see that. We talk about in our city and in our conference. And the only way we can have victory is that through our faith. Because the only way that we can become a just society is for those who injustice do not affect respond the same way that those who are mistreated respond. Because the injustice anywhere is key, quote, is, is offers no justice to all. So we cannot have justice until we all begin to have a needed conversation toward reconciliation so that the whole of the kingdom, the city, our Kentucky conference can be the better because of what God is doing. There is victory. But this victory only comes through in Jesus Christ. So thank you again today for, for joining us. I hope that was been something said or done to encourage. We didn't see any questions today. Um, so we're going to uh, begin to conclude as our time is why it has wound up. I want to thank you again. If you have any questions you want to continue past this, you may give me a call, contact me. We have a, a website at the uh, SBC21 at kyumc.org. And you will also be able to find this recorded uh, webinar there so you can share with your church and community. Thanks again, and thanks again for our communication specialist, Kathy Bruce, and giving her much-needed uh, assistance in making